Bonjour, I am Philippe Girin. Welcome back to the World History course. Last time we studied the political system of ancient Greece, specifically Athens and Sparta. Uh, and those two cities played a key role also in the three wars fought in the 400 and 300 BC between Greece and Persia. And that will be the topic for today's lecture as we focus on war, whether at sea or on land. Let's look at the armed forces on either side, starting with the Greeks. Last time I mentioned that Greece, around 500 BC, was divided into dozens of independent city-states uh, that often fought one another. Well, Greece had rolling hills and few open spaces and plains, so cavalry was not, huge, uh, not used much. The stirrup, for example, had not been invented anyway, so uh, ancient cavalrymen could not really fight on horseback uh, the way that uh, medieval knights would have. So heavy infantry, that was a staple. Greek infantrymen were called hoplines. Uh, they were armed with a sword and a lance or spear, which you could throw if need be, and that's the origin of the sport of uh, javelin today. Uh, the hoplites were also heavily armored with breastplate, helmet, greaves, uh, often made of bronze. Notice that the shield was held on the left while the right hand uh, would hold the spear. And that left a weak spot on your right side where there was no protection. So to avoid that, hoplites would fight as part of a phalanx, a squad of hoplites. They would form a continuous line so that your right flank would be protected by the overlapping shield of the man to your right, who was protected by his own neighbor, and so on, all the way to the, the poor chap at the end of the line. This way, there was a continuous wall of shields uh, that was hard to break through. Uh, there were usually several lines of hoplites uh, uh, right behind another in a phalanx. And because each man was equipped with a very long lance or spear, uh, those lances, even from the back rows, they would stick out from the front. Uh, it would be like a giant hedgehog. So between uh, the helmet and the dust of battles, uh, hoplites could see little. So they were guided by a fife, a person that would play various tunes uh, to, gu to guide the unit and make sure they would maneuver together. So between uh, the row of shields and the spears and uh, unity, uh, the Greek phalanx was almost impossible to defeat, as long as hoplites stuck together. The minute that some of the men ran away, there was a gap in the ranks and the enemy uh, could just sneak in. So it was really essential for hoplites to stick together as a unit. Maybe they would do so because in Athens, they were all citizens of democracy who fought for a shared ideal to defend their formal government. Or maybe they would do so because they were Spartans who had been trained since childhood to obey orders. Or maybe they would stick together because they were lovers. The best unit of the army of Thebes uh, was the Theban sacred band, which consisted of 150 homosexual couples, 300 men in all. Uh, these were seen as ideal soldiers because they would never abandon the person next to them who was a fellow citizen, a comrade in arms, but also a romantic interest. I mentioned last time how the values of ancient Greece often differed from ours. I'm old enough to remember how in the US, homosexual men were once considered to be not quite real men, effeminate, and definitely not suited to be soldiers. Up until 2011, as I recall, the US Army had a policy to fire any serviceman or woman who was openly gay. Don't ask, don't tell was the policy. Well, in Thebes, by contrast, those same men uh, were considered the best soldiers of the army. Uh, let's digress for a second, uh, because that issue really speaks to the greater acceptance of homosexuality in ancient Greece. Uh, we saw last time how men and women in ancient Athens and Sparta mostly socialized with each other, people of their own sex, even when they were married uh, to someone else. Uh, male Spartans spent the bulk of their life in barracks with other men, only sneaking out a bit to have sex with their bride. Well, that kind of male camaraderie could turn into romantic love, which was perfectly acceptable in ancient Greece, especially when involved a married older man with a younger romantic partner of the same sex, because then the older man would act as a mentor, a teacher towards the boy. I would not recommend that today, especially in a kind of a teacher-pupil relationship, because then you'd be accused, rightly, of pedophilia. Uh, but that was honorable by the standards of ancient Greece. There is less information on female homosexuality in part, well, generally because we know little about Greek women in general. Uh, but lesbianism uh, seems to have been practiced as well in ancient Greece. 
In fact, the word itself comes from a Greek word, uh, a Greek woman called Sappho. Uh, she was the most celebrated poet of her, path, uh, of her time, in part because of her love poems, some of which seem to have been intended for her female friends. So she had the reputation as a lesbian. She may or may not have been. Since she came from a Greek island called Lesbos, this is how we got the term lesbian after her. Some people also speak of sapphic love in reference to her. That's another way of speaking of uh, female homosexual love. All right, uh, finish uh, the digression, back to war in the ancient world. Let's now look at the people who fought the Greek phalanx, the Persians. Uh, these were an Indo-European group that migrated from the steppes of Asia to what is today Iran. And around 600 BC, they launched uh, or began an empire that would last with various ups and downs up until 600 AD, which is to say 1200 years. Uh, by comparison, the US has been a major power for what, a tenth of that, give or take. So uh, just that, that, that was a major achievement by itself to last as an empire for 1200 years. A lot of the credit for the empire's durability goes to a, a founder of the empire, Cyrus the Great, who lived in the 6th century BC. As the Persian Empire grew and grew from Afghanistan to Iran, Turkey to Egypt, uh, the main issue for rulers of Persia was, well, how do you keep the whole thing together? Until then, Persians had been bound by kinship bonds. They were all the same people. But when the empire became multi-ethnic, because it was so vast, uh, Cyrus the Great had to devise a system that defined the state as a geographical and political entity, not just a kinship. And that was a pretty novel and modern idea. So the first rule when you head a large organization is to delegate. Uh, Cyrus, who could not be everywhere at once, he would appoint governors for each province. They were called the satraps. And these would rule in his name, and they could be as authoritarian as they liked, as long as they collected taxes, raised soldiers, and stayed loyal to Cyrus. There was always a risk, however, that a distant governor might use those taxes and those soldiers for himself and then try to secede and break away. So to avoid that, Cyrus would send his eyes and ears. Uh, that was a term for royal agent or spy. Uh, they would show up unannounced at uh, the court of a satrap and then do a detailed audit to make sure that the satrap wasn't stealing money or scheming to secede. And that gives you a second rule of management, trust, delegate, but verify. So keeping the empire together also meant good communications. For that purpose, the Persians built the Persian Royal Road, a highway that was 1,600 miles long. Along the way, there would be relay stations so that couriers on a horse uh, could stop by, uh, rest, and maybe change horses. Think of it as the Pony Express, uh, or we'll see similar systems in other vast empires like Rome, the Mongols, or the Incas. In fact, it was so efficient that it only took about a week to cross the vast Persian Empire. So this way, the Emperor of Persia could learn quickly if a satrap had rebelled, and then send an army just as fast. For an empire to be strong, it needs to have a vast population as well. And that could be a challenge in Iran because it has many desert areas. And for that, Persians built an elaborate system of canals that they called Kanat. Kanats would start under a mountain somewhere or wherever there was an underground aquifer and then gently slope down to a nearby valley uh, where there would be covered canals to distribute all the fresh water. And some of them were dozens of miles long uh, sometimes underground, and then you had to dig access wells uh, to get uh, all the way to the depths of the canal. So that was really a giant undertaking, uh, but a successful one because some of these, amazingly, are still in use today in the 21st century. So to keep this diverse, far-flung empire together, the Persian king had to use a gentle touch. He allowed people to keep their own language and religion as long as they obeyed him. Uh, but he also used the typical tricks of the trade, such as uh, claiming to be a divinity and imposing an elaborate court etiquette to convince his subjects that he was no mere mortal. Uh, the palace of the king of Persia was so large that he could have 15,000 guests over in his dining room every night. That was a great way to show how rich and generous he was. And even then, the emperor did not dine with his guests. He dined alone in another room because, you know, he was a god. He would not mingle with the crown. Uh, to approach him, subjects had to follow an elaborate ceremonial. They had to kowtow, to bow, and also cover their mouths to make sure that their breasts did not waft away and mix in with the air that was breathed by the emperor. 
And I used to think that this was a bit too much, but I'm taping this lecture in the middle of the coronavirus epidemic, and that doesn't sound so stupid anymore, right? Let's digress for a second and mention the philosopher Zoroaster, who is also known as Zarathustra. Uh, he lived around 600 BC in ancient Persia. He was a prophet who created a religion named after him, Zoroastrianism. He saw life as an ongoing clash between good and the forces of evil. And ultimately, the gods of good and evil would fight in a grand day of reckoning, and hopefully God, uh, the god of good would prevail. Zoroastrianism was the inspiration for a later religion, also from Persia, called Manichaeism. And it also inspired much later religions, like Christianity and Islam, that also have as an endgame a concept of the apocalypse. And as a side note, Manichaean in English means somebody who has a viewpoint that is starkly white and black. So use it in your English essay if you want to get some extra points. You'll thank me later. Well, today there are a few uh, Zoroastrians in the world because Islam has become dominant in Iran and the Middle East in general, uh, but you'll still see some uh, Zoroastrian communities in India or right here in the US where some uh, Iranian immigrants have come. Anyway, back to our topic, war between Greeks and Persians. Uh, because Persia was such a vast and multi-ethnic empire, its army was also far larger and more diverse than its Greek equivalent. It had cavalry and chariots, and light infantry and archers and some heavier infantry uh, the immortals they're not immortals of course no one is uh, they were just called this way because they formed a unit of 10,000 uh, soldiers and they served as a personal bodyguard of the king if any one of them got killed another soldier would immediately be appointed to replace him in the ranks which is why they seemed immortal no matter how many soldiers you killed there were still 10,000 immortals in that unit they were heavy infantry by the standards of Persia, like the Hoplites, but not quite as well armored as the Hoplites. Uh, they wore a felt cap instead of a helmet, and their shield was made of wicker covered with leather. But even then, if you compare the Persian Empire and Greece on a map, a war between the two would seem like a mismatch. It was like David against Goliath, especially since Greece was divided into even smaller city-states. Um, but history sometimes works in mysterious ways, as we'll see. Let's look at the first Greek-Persian war now, which took place around 490 BC. And that began when some Greek people in Western Turkey began to complain of Persian rule. The Athenians were not involved in that dispute, but they were busy bodies, and so they couldn't help but send uh, some assistance to the rebellious Greeks that lived inside Persia. This obviously angered their overlord, the Persian emperor, by that point it was called Darius, and he wanted to punish Athens for meddling in the affairs of his empire. And Darius put his large army on a fleet, sailed across the Aegean Sea, and landed his troops in Marathon, which is just north of Athens. Now, right now it's difficult to know the size of ancient armies, uh, because generals often lied about the size of their own army to make themselves look stronger. Or, Alternatively, they would exaggerate the size of the enemy so that the victory would seem even more miraculous. But you're probably talking about roughly an army of 100,000 Persians taking on an army of 10,000 Athenians. Uh, they were vastly outnumbered. Undeterred, the Athenians formed the usual line of battle, the phalanx, and they just moved in. And they were lucky enough that on their flanks, the phalanx, they faced some foreign troops of the Persians uh, that were not 100% loyal to the Persian emperor Darius. And those troops began to uh, fall back and eventually run away. So the Greek flanks were able to converge eventually on the stronger Persian center where the immortals were, and that forced those troops to retreat because they were at risk of being trapped, like a pincer movement. So the Persians fled to their ships, uh, but they did not give up just now. Instead, they set sail to Athens to attack that city directly. So the Greek commander sent a messenger to Athens to notify the city of the, the great victory he had just won and warned that a fleet was upcoming and that they, they better man the defenses. That messenger was called Phaedipides, and he ran the whole distance from Marathon to Athens, which is over 40 kilometers, 26 miles. And then he delivered the good news caught his breath, and dropped dead. Well, I've run marathons myself. Uh, it's a grueling race, but normally you don't drop dead at the end. 
and I've since learned that the DPS actually had first gone to Sparta to ask for help, which was 150 miles away, my Athens. And then the Spartans had refused to help immediately, so the DPS had run back 150 miles back to Marathon to tell the bad news, and then the extra 25 miles to Athens, and that, uh, that's probably what killed him. So, as you've probably guessed by now, that story is the origin of a modern marathon. Uh, marathons were actually not run at the ancient Olympics in Greece because uh, their foot races were much shorter. Uh, it's in 1896 when a Frenchman named Philippe de Coubertin recreated the modern Olympics that he added a marathon race in order of the sacrifice of the Deepiness. Uh, the race is roughly 26 miles or 42 kilometers, uh, which is roughly the distance from Marathon to Athens. So after the victory, the Greek army marched as quickly as it could back to Athens, and by the time the Persian fleet showed up, well, the defenses of the cities were all manned, and the Persians had to face the same army in Athens that had just defeated them back in Marathon. So they gave up, they set sail again, crossed the Aegean Sea, and then returned to Persia in defeat. Marathon, that was a battle that the Athenians never forgot, or never let anybody forget about it. Uh, all alone as a city, they had defied the might of the Persian Empire, and they had won. The enemies were more numerous, but they were the subjects of a tyrant, and so they had fled as soon as the going got tough. And that's an important lesson. To win war, size isn't everything. Armament, tactics they also matter, uh, but also morale. For the Persians, the defeat of Marathon was a humiliation. Uh, Darius, the emperor, never got to exact his revenge in person, but his son Xerxes did. And that took some time to gather up a new expedition, and so the Second Greek-Persian War, uh, Match II, uh, that took place about 10 years later in 480 BC. So that second Persian army was even bigger than the first, maybe 200 or 300,000 men, huge by ancient standards. In this second war, many city-states joined the fight in Greece, not just Athens, because all of them were now under threat of invasion. But it took a while to conduct the diplomacy needed for such an alliance uh, against cities that were used to fighting one another. So in the meantime, a small detachment of 300 Spartans uh, was sent north to slow down the Persian advance. They met at Somopili, which would become uh, as big a part of Spartan history and myth as Marathon was to the Athenians. Uh, this battle against formidable odds was the ultimate test of valor for the Spartans. There's an anecdote that uh, when uh, they were told that P Persian archers were so numerous that their arrows would hide the sun, the king of the Spartans, Leonidas, uh, calmly responded, well, good, this way we will get to fight in the shade, unquote. Laconic, courageous, 100% certified Spartan. So, if you're interested in the battle, you might check out the movie 300. It's not the most historically accurate, and it's very violent, though in a, in a stylized way. And it also embraces a Greek trope of portraying the Persian as exotic, oriental, decadent, and effeminate. But it's an intriguing mix of alpha male, hee-ho militarism, and subtle homoeroticism. So, you're gonna see it once. At any rate, in real life, the 300 Spartans courageously held their ground for a few days until they were massacred to a man. So then the Persians, after that roadblock, uh, moved on to Athens, and there the people had consulted the oracle, who was a woman in Delphi who communicated with the gods and made cryptic statements about the future. So the oracle told the Athenians that they should protect themselves in that wall uh, behind their wooden walls, whatever that meant, wooden walls. So the Athenians figured that they should let the Persians capture the stone walls of their city, Athens, and instead fight a battle out at sea, and that's what the oracle meant by wooden walls, ships. So that naval battle took place at Salamis, just west of Athens, and it involved galleys, narrow ships that were propelled either by square sail or by oarsmen. Uh, the most common type uh, was a trireme with three rows of oarsmen. And these were free men in the case of the fleet of Athens. Uh, the main tactic was to ram your enemy. Uh, and then you could then remain connected and fight hand to hand on deck by boarding the enemy ship. Or you could back out your trireme and then the enemy ship uh, would sink because of the hole it had in the hull. So once again, the Persians outnumbered the Greeks and they used their smarts 
uh, the Greeks lured the Persians into a narrow strait, and then they had to proceed single file, more or less. And then the Greeks were awaiting them at the other end of the strait in a half circle, and this way they were able to prevail since the Persian fleet could not properly deploy, and in naval term that's called crossing the T, where your whole fleet is deployed, uh, whereas the enemy is single file and is not. So after their fleet was destroyed, the Persians could not bring more troops to Greece, or supplies though that were already there. So the rest of the army of Xerxes was defeated at another important battle, Plataea, and then the Greeks won the Second Greek-Persian War. Yet again, contemporary historians like Herodotus claim that the Greeks had won because of their superior form of government. They were free men who had fought the slaves of a foreign tyrant. The Third Greek-Persian War is quite different from the first two. Uh, that took place over a century later, in the 300s, and by that point, Athens was no longer an independent city-state. In fact, all of Greece had fallen under the rule of a single kingdom from the north called Macedonia, or Macedon. The king of Macedon was a young man destined to become one of the best-known figures in all history, Alexander the Great. That third war also is different because it began due to Greek aggression rather than Persian aggression. So what convinced Alexander to attack his powerful Persian neighbor? Well, for one thing, because he could. After he had united all of Greece, he had an army of roughly 50,000 hoplites at his disposal. Then there was also an element of revenge, one century after the two Persian invasions. Also, he may have tried to spread Hellenistic culture. Hellas is another term for Greece, so Hellenistic culture with two L's, that's simply Greek culture. Uh, remember that Alexander was a pupil of Aristotle, so he was a Greek thinker through and through. But to me, the main reason to attack Persia was simply megalomania. Alexander was a man of massive ambition who wanted to do something great, to become what the Greeks called a hero by conquering the whole known world. The term hero is thrown around a lot nowadays. You know, rescue a kitten from a tree and suddenly, my God, you're a hero. The meaning was more narrowly defined in ancient Greece. A hero was someone who did something so extraordinary that it would be remembered for generations, not just five minutes of fame. And there were different ways that you could achieve that level of fame. You could be the artist who designed the Parthenon, for example, or the athlete who won a prize in the Olympics, or a great philosopher like Socrates. Either way, you'd achieve a kind of immortality because people would remember your name forever. Let's digress again uh, for a second and tell you a little story. And that story take, uh, takes place in Ephesus, which is one of the Greek settlements in modern-day Turkey. So in that city of Ephesus, there was a kind of inconspicuous man you see everywhere. Middle-aged, neither rich nor poor, not particularly gifted, just average. The man in the gray flannel suit. So how could that kind of guy hope to ever become a hero to be remembered? He was not a great athlete, not a great warrior, not a great singer. And then he had an idea. We often remember people who did terrible things, not just great things. In the 20th century, we remember Gandhi, we remember Einstein, but also remember Stalin and Hitler. So if he could do something absolutely horrendous, then people would remember him and he would achieve immortality, albeit for all the wrong reasons, in a very twisted way. So as it happened, his hometown of Ephesus was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis. And so he set fire to it and he destroyed the temple. That'll get you in a spot in the history books. As a result, uh, the man was sentenced to death for his crime, and also the judge decreed that no one could ever say his name ever again. This way he would not be a hero, he would not be remembered. As it turned out, we know who he was. Herostratus. But his name will not be on the test because you don't need to memorize it. I don't want to promote awesome. Back to Alexander the Great. Uh, now you understand why he was so eager to attack the Persians. That seemingly impossible war would be his way of becoming a hero of achieving immortality. And amazingly, he succeeded, in part because he relied on the powerful Greek phalanx, in part because he was a gifted general. His victory at Gogamela, for example, has become a stuff of legend. But he also knew how to lead men, to inspire them. He had charisma. And there's a million anecdotes about Alexander the Great, some of which are probably apocryphal. But I'll just mention a couple to give you a sense. 
One anecdote involved his horse Bacephalus, which was a formidable beast, so large and so formidable that no one had ever been able to uh, tame that horse. So Alexander took a stab at it, of course, since it was impossible. He grabbed the horse, turned it towards the sun, and voila! He was able to calm Bacephalus and ride it. As it turned out, the horse was afraid of his own shadow because it was so big. So all he had to do was to get the horse to face the sun so that his shadow would be behind him. Which means, I guess, that Alexander the Great invaded Persia in the morning facing east. The second story I will tell you involved a knot located in the city of Gordium in Turkey. That knot was so tight and intricate that no one could figure out how to loosen it. So, of course, Alexander had to try. He took a look at the problem, thought about it, got his sword out, and simply cut the knot in two. That's it. Job done. And ever since then, cutting the Gordian knot has become an expression that means to give a simple and elegant solution to some intractable problem. So now you're starting to see a, a pattern. Whether it's with the invasion of Persia, or taming his horse, or untying the knot, Alexander liked to do things just because they were rumored to be impossible. It was his way of proving that he was above the mediocrity of mankind, that he was a hero. Eventually, things got to his head a little when he conquered Egypt, which by then was a Persian province, and some local priests convinced him that he was a pharaoh, son of the god Amun-Ra, or even a god himself. Aside from his delusions of grandeur, Alexander was a great general, who won one battle after another until he unseated the Persian emperor, who fled east, and so Alexander pursued him east into Afghanistan, into Central Asia, and then realized that there was a country called India to the east, which he decided to conquer to. And that's where his charisma finally failed him. By, his man, by then, his men realized that conquering the whole known world was an endless task. It was not just Persia, but India, and then beyond that loomed China. So maybe it was time to turn around and go home. So Alexander, abandoned by his men, had to turn back, much to his chagrin, through the desert of Pakistan, since someone had told him that it was impossible to do, and he returned to Babylon in Persia, where he contracted a disease and died at the young age of 32. So what do we make of Alexander's legacy, the one thing that he cared about? Well, the legend of Alexander the Great is still there. For centuries thereafter, he set the bar for ambitious young men like Napoleon, will also try to conquer the world by age 30. Here we are in the year 2020, and I'm telling the story of Alexander the Great still. Uh, the other legacy that he had was that he helped to spread Hellenistic culture in Central Asia. He found in a lot of cities wherever he went, named after himself, of course, and those became centers uh, that spread Greek art and Greek learning and the Greek language. Alexandria in Egypt is the most famous of those cities. As far as his empire, however, that proved short-lived. After he died, his generals bickered among themselves, and the Persian Empire soon sprang back from its ashes like a phoenix. Though there is one of the generals of Alexander that took over Egypt and set up a new dynasty of pharaoh there, of Greek origin, the Ptolemaic dynasty, and that lasted a few centuries. You're probably familiar with the last of the pharaohs of that dynasty. Her name was Cleopatra. So there you have it. The Greeks and the Persians fought three major wars, all of which the Greeks won, though ultimately the Persian Empire endured. Anyway, you could attribute those victories to the skills of leaders like uh, Leonidas or Alexander the Great, or the battlefield tactics of the phalanx and the hoplites, or the superiority of the Greek system of government. I will let you be the judge. At any rate, it's a fantastic story. Well, more war and slavery next time, I'm afraid, because we will be headed to the Roman Empire. Goodbye. Au revoir.